Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming down this evening. Uh, my name is Patrick Henningsen. I'll be hosting tonight. Uh, thank you for coming and attending the perfect storm. This is the first event of its type that I've ever been aware of, and the timing of it couldn't be more crucial uh, with the run-up to the London 2012 Olympics starting this weekend. We have a very diverse lineup of speakers tonight uh, from a lot of different areas, from the media, uh, investigative journalists, and geopolitical analysis. So it's going to be an absolutely information-packed evening. So I do encourage you to stick around for all three speakers, because I think it will get better and better as the evening goes by. And if you don't know about myself, uh, my name is Patrick. I'm one of the editors of a website called Infowars.com. It's an American-based website uh, associated with Alex Jones, a radio talk show host. And I'm also a Middle East analyst for Russia Today. It's a global satellite news network. My interest in this subject uh, goes back many, many years. In my previous life, I worked in the head offices of Securicor in the UK before they were merged with G4S, and I was also on staff of the American Embassy in London. This is my previous life. Now I'm an investigative journalist, and uh, some people would call me a conspiracy theorist, which I have been called recently because I've been raising the red flag about the security and the military buildup and all these facets surrounding London, London 2012. And the thing that I tell everybody is, in this particular instance, I would love to be called a nutty conspiracy theorist at the end of the London 2012 games, because the last thing that I would like to see is that any incident happens or anything unfortunate happens where the public is put at risk, people are injured or worse. This is one instance where I really want to be wrong. And that's probably the first time I've ever felt that way since I've been doing what I'm doing right now professionally. Um, the security industry, it's a very interesting business. We're in the middle of a protracted recession that's been going on, as far as I know, as a business person in early 2000s, the recession in the business world really hit after 9-11 in 2001. That's when contracts started getting more competitive, costs start, started being cut, and then we were hit with the housing bubble, then the banking crisis, then the bailout crisis, okay? Now, the thing that's interesting about the economy right now is there's only two growth areas in the economy. One is the arms industry, and the other is the security industry. And it's growing massively in all areas. Uh, if you look at airport security, you look at CCTV, surveillance, all government contracts associated with all these new technologies, new, new, new industry that's built completely around a threat assessment, but nobody's ever bothered to question, where's this threat assessment coming from? Is it real? What's it based on? And a lot of it is based on fear. The security industry is an international, multi-billion dollar, multi-billion pound industry that is based on one thing, which is fear. Fear for your safety, risk assessments, threat assessments. And uh, I met, I met an a outstanding, esteemed intelligence professional who was the South Yorkshire Police's principal intelligence analyst who was sacked from his job in 2010 because he delivered a threat assessment that said, I don't think that domestic Muslim terrorists are uh, responsible for 7-7 and they're not a major threat to the safety of Britons in this country. He was sacked for his professional opinion as a professional police ranking analyst in South Yorkshire Police. They were responsible looking after the areas where these so-called bombers came from in Leeds and Sheffield, okay? that is a very brave man who stepped forward. We need more of these types of people to step forward. One of our speakers, who is in fact our next speaker, did a very brave little enterprise, and I've wondered if what sort of hunch he was working on when he got it in his head. He's probably thinking, I was mad to do this, but he went undercover for a multinational security company, partly Israeli-owned, partly British-owned, and to find out where the holes were. 
and in the recruiting process and, just to, and really what he did is exposed uh, negligence, he exposed many things, but the one thing that I, I, I was impressed with with this gentleman was he exposed the complete failure of the privatized security state. And these are the people that are supposed to be taking the place of our police force in the future. This is our public services, the essential ones being sold off to the highest bidder. And what do you get in return? You don't get safety, you don't get professionalism, and most of all, not much accountability. So on that note, I would like to introduce our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Fellows. Hi, everyone. Oh, is it working? Is it on my own? Can you? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, it's, uh, uh, I've got a few notes that I've made just so I can keep myself on track, so I hope you don't mind. Um, yeah, uh, I went into to G4S um, basically uh, to, um, to see what they were like. You know, I, I, I'd heard lots of stories um, about them being in Afghanistan and doing horrendous things to people, killing lots of people, um, even killing their own guys. Um, these were um, uh, sort of special forces uh, guys. And so I thought, what great opportunity the Olympics would provide is to actually go into G4S, work with them, and see what they were like. And I honestly thought this was going to be a small story that uh, would be on Channel 4 News, and um, uh, where Andy Davis, the Home Affairs correspondent, would deliver the information that G4S was either not so great, you know, because I, I didn't think they would do it very well, really. So um, uh, with that in mind, I kind of started researching G4S, and what they want to have happen, uh, I'll take my hat off now, actually, because um, it's annoying me. Um, uh, what they want to have happen is they want control of every aspect of policing in the United Kingdom. So they want to be able to arrest you. They want to be the police on the street. They uh, want forensic science duties. They want detective duties. Everything the police does now, that's what they want to do. They also want to be magistrates in magistrates courts. They just don't want to do security in magistrates courts. They actually want to be the magistrates as well. And of course, we know they do detention centres and prisons already. So the reality is, over the next couple of years, G4S will arrest you. They will take you to a G4S police station where you'll process through a G4S magistrates court into a G4S prison. What's the chances of you getting out of that prison, really? <laughs> None. And for, you know, minor crimes, really. Because they're going to have a list of things. Um, uh, for, I'll tell you a story very quickly. That's why I got my notes, I digress. However, I'll tell you a story very quickly. Yesterday, my car was stolen off my driveway. Um, coincidence? Maybe not. Anyway, um, uh, I saw the guy. I was standing at my window, so here's my window. And I went, oh, there's my car. You know, and it's a second-hand car, but it looked really great. So I thought, wow, that's good. Uh, and I'd just done loads of work on it. So I was actually quite impressed the way it drove off and it didn't stall at the top of the road like it usually does for me. But anyway. um, so he got it going better than I did. Uh, so anyway, so I saw this car drive off the road in my car. Uh, and I called the police. And the guy on the phone said, look, don't worry. You're not going to see the police probably today. But the call's out. They'll be looking for it. The cameras will be looking and all this kind of stuff, right? Let's hope they drive past an Olympic venue, because I live in Greenwich. Uh, the camera recognition system will pick them up and you'll get your car. And I went, oh, OK, great. Within about 15 minutes of that phone call, um, the police arrived at my door, and they were lovely, and they were friendly, and they were like, oh, you got your car, you know, stolen, and this is awful, blah, 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 and it turns out the guy actually had fished my keys from my uh, kitchen, through my kitchen window, um, off my counter, where I just dumped them next to, you know, the, uh, um, the George Foreman thing, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and fished them and stole my car, you know, they actually got it back a couple of hours later, um, uh, except now it's a crime scene because it was used in a burglary, so I still don't have my car. But anyway, uh, that's the thing. So the police were really good. And, you know, not often I can actually say, hand on heart, I've had an experience with the police and it was really good. They were, they were professional, they were polite, they empathised, they did everything that I actually expected them to do and more. And actually, two other police officers then came around to take a statement a bit later on. And, uh, you know, I told them I was the G4S whistleblower and they said 35,000 police want to thank you. So that was uh, um, something. So G4S wouldn't do that. They're not going to come around. If your car's been stolen, unless that's a priority for them, unless they're going to get paid money for investigating that crime, they will not come around. And I suspect they're only actually going to get paid for doing uh, on results of murders and rapes and, and, and stuff like that. They have a list of things, as they do already. So uh, with that in mind, I decided to um, 
uh, uh, to go to GFS for the Olympics. Okay, so this is what I did. Um, this is what you need. You need one of these. It's um, uh, an SIA license. You've still seen the door supervisors with these things, right? This is, um, this is what you need to work in the security industry, or, uh, right? So, um, so three years ago, I thought, you know what, if I'm going to get a job at G4S, I'm going to have to be really quite a good security guy, right? So I'm going to go and get some training. Um, I got my license, started working weekends and a couple of evenings a week as a security officer. What I didn't know was, actually, if I'd just gone for the interview, I could just walk straight through the door at G4S. The, 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 no training required. I didn't do that. I spent three years, you know, uh, building up my experience. So, um, uh, come January, I saw an ad on TV that says, G4S is open, come in and start the recruitment process. So, I'm wondering, with my CV, my polished shoes, with my suits, I look great. Everyone else was there with jeans and t-shirts and stuff, right? no experience. So, um, uh, after putting in my details into a, a computer system, uh, it was like the G4S intranet site, uh, um, I also put into that internet site the fact that I was a journalist, that's part of my um, work history, um, that I, uh, one of my references was a journalist, and that one of my work references was a media agency, because I supply media agencies with various bits of news and, and what have you. And so, if they had just checked my references, they would have known very quickly who I was and what I was doing. It's as simple as that, right? You can't lie, because as soon as you lie at these things, they say, oh, well, you see, you've lied about that, then everything else is a lie. So you cannot lie, right? Um, so, and, and of course, I had uh, this other, uh, uh, just to prove that, actually, I am a, an accredited journalist. Uh, it's a press pass, and even people have said, oh, but you can fake that. I said, well, yeah, you can, but if you call the number on the back, which the police do all the time, they stop me and say, why are you filming me? What are you doing? I say, well, here's my press pass. They call the number on the back, and it goes through to the agency, and you're accredited. They say, yes, you are a journalist, and yes, you are supposed to be working. And I have the, um, uh, I'm a reporter and a photographer on there, so I can take pictures and video and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I can covertly record you and all that kind of thing. So, um, so we do the internet site, so if they had checked my references, which they didn't do at any point, they would have found out that um, uh, I worked in the media industry. But they didn't do it. It simply just did not happen. So um, uh, the next part of the interview, after doing that, they said it's an interview section, and it's going to be a bit of a test. And I was like, right, OK, so I'm going to have my line of why I want to work for the Olympics kind of going on in my head, right? All that kind of stuff, as you do. Uh, in, in fact, it was um, a room not so dissimilar to this, and there's little cubicles, and say this part of here was a cubicle here. And, uh, and a woman took me in, and, um, and on the table there would be three cups. And she goes, can you smell what's in the cups? And I went, okay. So I smelled, and it was an, an orange smell. And it was a chemical smell. It was chemically, you know, because obviously it was fake. Right? And the lemonade smell. So it's a chemically lemonade smell. And she went, that's very good. And I said, the other one, there's nothing in there, but I can tell you what the paper cup smells like. And she went, nah, don't bother. I went, okay, fine. So, uh, and then she said, here's, um, uh, I'm going to show you some, I think she said symbols. I think actually what she did say is symbols. And, uh, and, and she showed me, one was a number one. So that's a number one. And another one was a number eight. That's a number eight. And the other one's a squiggly line that kind of looked like a seven. I said, that's not a number. That's a squiggly line that looks like a seven. She goes, very good, you've passed the test. <laughs> I was in. That's it. I'm now a security officer at G4S. Thank you very much. Go wait in the, uh, the next room and uh, for the next stage of it. Went into the next room, sat there for another hour, because you know, each room you go in, you wait an hour or two, right? And, uh, and someone came in and said, thank you very much, Ben. Um, go home now, wait for the email, and uh, we'll confirm you as a G4S security officer for London Olympics 2012. Hey, isn't that fun? I went, great, fantastic. I didn't show my CV once. I kind of walked out of there going, hold on a minute. I've spent three years doing all this great security work. <laughs> I've looked after, you know, George Clooney. I've looked after all these, you know, celebrities. I worked for a celebrity company, you see. I was in China White, seeing them do, you know, drugs off the tables and all that kind of stuff. That's another story. Um, uh, so anyway, I get this email. And it says, congratulations, you are one step closer to uh, your 2012 dream. I went, Fab, I'm in, right? So, um, uh, 3rd of April rolls around. It's my two training days. What they do is they send you an email. Everything's done by email. And they say, these are going to be your two training days. You're never told how many training days you're going to do. Just here's two training days. And one was going to be the 3rd of April, and the other one's going to be the 11th of April. And it was the first one was basic skills in security. And I thought, oh, I'll be good at that. That's, that sounds like fun. I'll go to that one. So I went along, and again, it was a classroom. It had a PowerPoint presentation, not so dissimilar to this. And it had about um, uh, 50, 60 people in each room. 
um, and it was classroom. It was, it was based in an old school in Stratford. Uh, it's the John F. Kennedy uh, High School, I think it was. There was a big sign over uh, G4S logo on it, and then it fell down the other day when I went back to collect the uniform, and uh, I think that was the school. So um, you learned for the first, well, it was until lunchtime about the two mascots, Wenlock and Menderville, with the one-eyed creepy thing. And I went, they're creepy! And everyone laughed and stuff like that, you know. Um, you also learned that there was 26 um, sports in the Olympics. There was 10.4 million tickets sold. And I was like, okay, when's basic skills and security gonna start? No, 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 it's not gonna start. And, uh, and the guy said, he said, there's 10.4 million tickets sold, and if there's a bomb in the Olympic Stadium, don't worry, it's already factored into the system. <laughs> and I went, what does that mean? Because I was already the, the chatty guy. I was at the front, I had my pad, you know, I was doing the thing. And, uh, and he said, oh, it, it means it's built in already. <laughs> Great. And I was like, that's sinister. That's scaring me already, right? And the school out the window, we could see the Olympic Stadium. So I'm looking at the Olympic Stadium going, there's a bomb in the Olympic Stadium, right? And uh, um, so anyway, uh, this went on. And uh, we had, we had a, a break. And at, at lunchtime, they'd, they'd give you a sandwich. And um, uh, these sandwiches were kind of bust in. And, and you got given a packet and, and what have you. Anyway, um, we are also told about um, uh, the evacuation of London. They said, in the event of something happening at the Olympics, we're going to evacuate the whole of London. Wow. And uh, you're all going to be involved, you being the security officers, obviously. And I went, uh, well, how are we going to be involved? Because you'll be dealing with members of the public. I was like, oh, OK, um, how? You know, I had all these questions. And I'm like, don't talk, just listen, right? And you got that a lot. It was kind of, uh, one guy um, actually told me to be a robot, but I'll get to that bit in a minute, um, which I thought was particularly insane of them. But they didn't tell me at any point during my training how to evacuate the Olympic Stadium. We've told about the evacuation of London on several occasions, but not how to evacuate the Olympic Stadium. We weren't told how to evacuate the velodrome. They didn't even say, oh, well, you know what? You're going to have a commanding officer, and your commanding officer will tell you what to do. <coughs> Nothing like that. Right? Didn't happen once. So we were told that. The majority of the class was made up of um, uh, the, the indigenous population of, uh, of Stratford and Hackney, East London, where I live in Greenwich. Uh, and predominantly, it was um, Asians and African people uh, in there. And um, uh, there was a question where one of the guys said, the trainer said, does anyone have a problem searching people with disabilities? <coughs> Everyone's hand pretty much went up in the classroom. I went, but it's the Paralympics as well as the Olympics. <laughs> what are you here for? It's like, shut up, you're the chatty guy, right? I was like, OK. Um, and then there was a, a, a sort of hideous debate about um, which sparked off um, between the people in the room um, as to how people um, became uh, disabled. And the overriding thought was um, that, uh, that I was left with, which was quite disgusting, I have to say, was uh, the debate seemed to focus on the fact that you had clearly done something bad in a previous life and you were being punished in this one. And I was like, oh my god, these are security officers? You know, for the Olympics, you know, talk about treating people with dignity and respect and... No, these are crazies. You can't have any of these people. Anyway, there were 800 a day going through this and we we're all told the same thing. Everyone got exactly the same script. I poked my head into other classrooms and it was always the same stuff that you were being taught. So nothing different. 800 people a day, apparently. Um, uh, and actually, a lot of them didn't speak English. And, you know, I find myself feeling, going, you know what, you said that a lot, dude. And, Oh, you look coming across as a bit of a racist, you know? But it was a fact. All I'm telling you is what I saw and what I heard, uh, and, and that's all I can do. And the point being is that when you're presented with someone, in actual fact, I met someone in Greenwich, uh, one of the security officers yesterday, and he was trying to get to the David Beckham Academy, uh, which is in North Greenwich, near the station, and he was in Greenwich Town Centre. Well, that's a good three, or three miles, maybe, something like that. And he couldn't communicate to me in English that he was lost. <laughs> he was just like oh, pointing at this email, you know. So in the end, I had to actually get his phone and read his email, his congratulations, you've now been picked to go to this. I was like, yeah, and there's a whole page of that and then what have you. And then it, it kind of got to the David Beckham Academy. And I went, oh, you're really lost. <laughs> and he was going, can I run? 
I was like, no, 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 no. You need to get the bus from over there. And I was doing his job. I was saying, get the bus from over there. It'll take you to the road. You get off it, you'll see it. Da, 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 it will, you know, where the cable car is. You cannot miss it, right? Anyway, he, he, he wandered off in the opposite direction. <laughs> um, uh, so that's why I keep mentioning about people not speaking English, because it's important. If you come to the Olympic Games or any event, and you want to know information, this green gardener suit, which is the security suit, by the way, this is, this is the actual uh, uniform that you'll be wearing. I didn't come dressed like this tonight uh, because I didn't want to get stopped on the train and asked loads of questions. Um, but this is the, uh, the accreditation pass. This is the official accreditation pass for security. I can now get into any security area within uh, London Olympics with that. And over 1,000 are unaccounted for, at least. That's, as, that's as how much they'll admit to. Over a thousand of these passes are unaccounted for right now. Um, so uh, I'll give anyone a hundred quid. No, I'll give anyone a pound because I've got a pound on me. If you can spot a G4S logo on here anywhere. And apparently, this is um, the pride event for G4S. This is the proudest time they're ever going to be. And they haven't even thought to put a logo on their uniforms. And even LOCOG, there's no. London rings. I was really disappointed. I thought at least get a cap with London rings on. Uh, you're in the Olympics, so you're going to have London Olympic uniform. Nothing. It's just, you look like a gardener. That's it. <laughs> you get the bum bag, which doesn't really fit me. I've kind of had to tuck it into the back of my trousers. Uh, but in here, you get a water bottle. And uh, you get some sun cream, which I thought was really nice. And um, <laughs> no, you, you're, out, you're outdoors. Get some sun. You know, tan yourself up. And, uh, uh, but what you're not allowed to do is, um, well, there's no room to bring a packed lunch. So you're forced to go and buy McDonald's in the stadiums. You're not allowed to go out, so that's all that the food is, basically. Um, so you have to bring your own money and you have to pay for food. So uh, I didn't think that was very good. So anyway, uh, I've digressed a bit, haven't I? So that's why I was mentioning about not speaking English, simply for the fact that it's, it, you need it to communicate with people and hopefully a second language, maybe French. I speak a bit of French, so I thought I'm going to be useful. Um, one of the people uh, in there was a Polish guy and in uh, sort of pidgin English, he put his hand up, he was massive, he was a big, big, big guy. And he basically said, I've been picked already to be a team leader. And everyone went, huh? And I thought, well, I haven't. And I've got all this security work and all this security experience. A police officer in the room turned around and says, I've been a police officer for 25 years, and I've not been picked for a team leader or to be a group leader or anything like that. And this Polish guy goes, oh, well, I've been picked already. It's very good. <laughs> I thought, oh, we're in trouble, you know? This sparked another argument with uh, the guy from Devonshire Police Force, or ex-Devonshire Police Force, and this Polish guy. And then, in the end, the Polish guy, they said, either sit down or leave, because he was just really annoying. Um, and also, there was Gurkhas in my class. Um, the Gurkhas, they were there. They were, he'd been a Gurkha all his life. You know, he now lived here, wanted to be part of the Olympics, thought, again, he'd be a team leader, a group leader. All that experience uh, in the army, nothing. Didn't get picked for anything. He was just like me, just working the PSA, which is a pedestrian screening area, which is the area you get in an airport uh, when you put your your bag through the x-ray machine and you walk through the, um, uh, the walk-through metal detector. That's the area that we'll be working in. There's like hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, I, I'm an x-ray operator, by the way. I, I had half a day's uh, training and uh, I, I passed. And in actual fact, the computer system I did the test on wasn't working properly, but that doesn't matter because you passed. And I went, <laughs> but if it wasn't working, how do you know I can actually do it? Don't worry about it, mate. Be the robot. That's basically what I got a lot. So that was my first day, really. Um, that's what we learned. Nothing about security. Um, nothing about, you know, this is how you pad someone down, you know. This is, this, this is, this is what you're going to expect on your first day. This is, you know, thousands of people for the Olympics are all going to turn up. And this is what you're going to... No, nope, nothing like that. We got the mascots. We got little arguments going on about not wanting to search people with disabilities. And um, uh, we got language issues and people who've been picked for team leaders and stuff. And that was the entire day. Um, on the screens, you had what I refer to really as their idealized version of what they really want. And it's kind of had like a robotic voice. You know, if you've seen some of those YouTube clips and they put like a robotic voice on it to disguise, you know, whoever it is speaking or something like that, right? It was very much like that. And we had a female one, so it was, so, so it was kind of, um, uh, it didn't really, it, we knew it was female voice, but it didn't quite sound like a woman, it didn't quite sound like a man. Maybe they did that on purpose, I don't know. But these things were incessant. 
And all the trainers would do is click, click the machine on, uh, talk to you for a little while about something inane, you know, like maybe the bombs factored into the stadium. And then, oh, by the way, and as soon as you wanted to ask a question, click onto another one. And all I could do really was sit in the front and ask one or two questions at most, really. Um, uh, before I was told to shut up. And I got known for being the questions guy. They were like, oh, has the questions guy got any questions? You know, and then everyone would laugh. So, you know, I thought, hold on a minute, you're trying to humiliate me, and all I want to do is find out information from you bozos. You know, and this was run by a company called Contemporary International. And Contemporary International is an events management company. And all they do, basically, is have ex-soldiers in them, and they do presentations, and they train military and all sorts of, they go to schools, all sorts of stuff. I couldn't actually find um, a lot of information out on them. Uh, I actually thought they might be owned by G4S, but we haven't been able to find anything. And if you go to their websites or anything like that, you need a password, you need passcodes. It's very sinister. It's all, it doesn't point, it's, it does, it's not good. Um, so anyway, this brings me on to uh, the 11th of April. That was just day one. And uh, this was uh, rapid scan uh, training. And rapid scan is a make uh, of people that do uh, walk-through metal detectors and x-ray machines, right? And um, so I was going to be trained uh, 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 to see if I was going to be good enough to be an x-ray operator. And we were given the, the PowerPoint presentation, which was the colours to look for. I couldn't tell uh, when they showed us the image of an umbrella that that was an umbrella. It was so difficult. It was like being given uh, Russian to learn during a day and then having to have a conversation with a Russian, fluent Russian speaker of the evening that was going to be broadcast on television. Do you know what I mean? It was that terrifying. I went, oh, that looks like a gun. He goes, that's no, an umbrella, mate. I went, oh, OK. Uh, another one, he pulled up an IED, and, uh, and I went, looks like an iPod. He goes, no, nah, it's a bomb, mate. You're dead. You killed everyone. <laughs> I'm like, I can't do this. I'm not the guy. You, you don't want me. You know, I, I, I was panicking. And other people in the room were kind of giving each other looks, and they were kind of going, I don't think I can do this either, you know? Because as soon as you x-ray something, it looks completely different, right? You, you need training, you need experience. We didn't even have somebody come to us who was an x-ray operator and said, oh, ah, don't panic, these are the things that you look for. You know, I do it when I, when I give talks on filmmaking. I say, well, don't worry about all the equipment. All you need is this, this, and this, and off you go, right? Everything else will sort itself out, right? So we didn't, we didn't have that. So um, we were given this PowerPoint presentation, we looked at the colors, it was kind of like, Orange was a, a, a organic material, so if anything orange turned up, you knew that was an organic material. Um, blue and black would be sort of like, you know, wires and lead-based things, metals and things like that, you know. So, so you've got that image in your head of these are the colours I need to have. Um, and then at the end of that, uh, they gave you a little test at a computer screen. And I've already said the test was broken, it didn't work. And they wouldn't explain to me why it was broken, they just said uh, the next day, uh, well the next time I was there, when I asked for my results, they said, oh, don't worry about that. Everyone passes. Uh, oh, and by the way, the machine didn't work anyway. I was like, shouldn't we take it again? And they're like, no, nah, you will pass. It's fine. So everybody in that room that I was in passed the x-ray. And they're all x-ray operators now, which is uh, crazy. Um, so you were, you were bombarded with information. I mean, really, truly bombarded with it. And every time you wanted to ask anything, um, you were either ignored or you were, they answered half a question, right? So, for example, I say, so how are we going to evacuate all of London? And you'd get this question of like, oh, well, you know, if a nuclear weapon or a chemical weapon goes off, everyone will want to leave, won't they? Huh? <laughs> right then. I suppose you're right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was my first two days. So no uh, security training in the first day, and now I'm an extra operator because I passed the test on the broken program. Uh, it brings me to the 11th of June, which is my third day of training, right? And uh, Tanya and Nick are our um, two uh, people now who are taking us through the next bit of the process. And um, uh, they loved each other. They loved themselves. They loved to hear themselves talk. They hardly used the clicky thing on the presentation. They were talking about it all themselves. They loved it. Um, and basically, they told us that, again, there was an evacuation plan, and the Olympics was so huge, there's so many people working on it. There was something like 24,000 security personnel in total. There was 170,000 contractors who go in with different services and all this kind of stuff. And there's 200,000 casket linings. What's a casket lining? It's like, chatty guy again. Yeah. 
exactly. He said, oh, it's a plastic coffin, mate. If it's about four people in it, I went, well, that's 200,000. 800,000 people, what are you expecting here, right? It's like, you're the chatty guy, right? So again, uh, lots of information and um, uh, no real explanation as to why they'd have them, you know? Uh, they also told us about drones, had drones. Uh, in actual fact, we saw one on uh, um, uh, last week, and we we're actually trying to film it, but it was too high, and we didn't have a good enough camera. But we now it's, we know it's out there, so we're going to try and get some up on YouTube, uh, or at least film it anyway. Um, drones, and they clicked the button, and there was a presentation, and you saw that footage that you see on TV, but this is a more graphic of the the, the, the infrared image of the drone dropping the bomb, and um, arms, legs, explosion. This was at 10 o'clock in the morning, and uh, it was horrible, you know? I'd never seen anything like that before. I mean, you know, I've seen really, really gruesome things, but when you see it from above, it's dispassionate, it's just like, and they're like, yeah, they're all terrorists, by the way, they're all dead now. <laughs> they look like people to me. <laughs> it could have been anybody. I don't know that they're terrorists. I don't know that these were evildoers or whatever they want to say the bogeyman is now, you know? These are just people being blown up, and they were just reveling in it, you know? So, um, uh, we were offered, uh, in a break, this was um, an interesting thing, uh, a guy came up to me with his bag, and, uh, and, and I'd seen him sort of like, you know, open his bag and looking at people, and people picking in. And uh, he came up to me and goes, here mate, he goes, you want to buy some weed? <laughs> I went, no, really not. You're in a security training course, dude. You know, there's police everywhere. Well, in the course, right? They're not actually going to be in the Olympics, but they're in the room. And, it's, and you, you know, you smell the skunky smell as you do, you know, as you walk past the kids in the park, you all smell it, right? We all know what that smell is. Uh, I have nothing against drugs, by the way. Nothing whatsoever, just not in the security training classroom <laughs> for the Olympics, you know? Old fashioned, there's a time and a place for things like that. That wasn't it, right? Which is what I, uh, I told him. Anyway, he's like, all oh, right, yeah, you're weird. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, <laughs> so he went away. The guy, the trainer, Nick, uh, good old Nick, um, who kept had a had a handheld wand, and um, he kept uh, wanding himself. Like that. And uh, and he goes, you know what? It keeps going off. It's like I'm a bullet magnet. I got shot in uh, Afghanistan. I'm like, that's awful. That's a horrible thing to say to everybody, right? He said, I'm a bullet magnet. I am. I'm like, yeah. You're the guy not to stand next to next time I'm on patrol. Um, so uh, he, good old Nick, saw this guy. He sort of looked around as he's doing his presentation, what have you, and he, he saw him showing his bags to this other guy. <laughs> and he went, Oi, mate, can you do that in the break outside? <laughs> he didn't call the police, right? Apparently, we had police there, all waiting to come in and bust you and all this kind of stuff. Didn't call the police, didn't even get him outside and say, What are you doing trying to sell? You're in the Olympics, man, right? You're supposed to be an Olympic security guard. We can't have you selling drugs. We can't have you dealing drugs. We can't have you smoking drugs. What are you talking about? You're off the course. You're out of here. Nah, do it in the break. <laughs> that was that. So um, Nick also said that we, and this is what I found quite scary, is that um, uh, we had to wear our uniforms to and from work. And, uh, and I went, well, hold on a minute. So I'm going to be in my house getting dressed, fine. I'm then going to go walk all the way down to my tube station, get on the train, whatever, get up to Stratford. Um, so a terrorist can spot me going to work. It's like, yeah. It's like, OK. Um, and then when I come home, a terrorist could view me, you know, because it's all about terrorism. So it's, it's, uh, I actually did try and bring up the point that, you know, I could count the actual times terrorism is actually taking place on my hand, you know, with, with disgruntled. But anyway, that was another story. <laughs> they did not want to hear that. They were like, you conspiracy theorist. I was like, dude, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, uh, what was I just saying? Um, that's right, wearing, thank you very much, thank you. Uh, this is why I digress, this is why I need my notes, because otherwise I, you know. So we're wearing uniforms, and he said, um, and he says, yeah, I know, it's a problem, isn't it? Because a terrorist could view you, um, see where you live, take hostage your family, uh, and uh, kill your dog, and make you do things, like let them in through the PSA, or let them in through a gate, or something like that, so they could go and ruin the Olympics for everybody. I went, uh, and you know this, and you're still <laughs> asking us to wear our uniforms. He goes, yeah, because there's nowhere to get changed at the Olympics. <laughs> I said, hold on a minute. This place has been built, right? It's taken years to build this massive stadium. 
right? They know all these people are going to be working there, and they haven't put anywhere where you can go in and get changed, right? Where you don't have to wear your uniforms. Like, nah, mate, that would be huge to do. But, but the Olympics is huge. How bad? How big can it be? Anyway, um, that's when he turned around to me and says, "You know what? The best thing for you to do is not ask so many questions." <laughs> be the robot. And that was it. Be the robot. And then the other, uh, I asked another question. I went, "Oh, but hold it, it's <laughs> robot." And that's all they want you to do. Just be the robot. So um, uh, they were obviously, you know, and he also said, and Tanya, the, uh, the, uh, there's always two in the room. Uh, usually one would do the presentation, and obviously the more co confident one, I guess, and one would sit at the back uh, or sit next to um, doing, doing laptopy things or doing, uh, checking on the phone, um, uh, which brings me on to the idea of phone jammers. Apparently, in every classroom, in every bit of the school that we're in, phone jammers are in operation. So do not use your mobile phone. Well, okay, but Tanya's using hers over there. Isn't it going to have... You know? It's like, no, 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 no. They're special. <laughs> Why are these special phone jammers, right? And he goes, because it lets you make a call, or it might let you say a text or anything like that, but like in a week's time, it will break down, and the phone company can't uh, put it back on again. It will cost you a fortune to get it on, so don't use your mobile phones in here. And... Uh, in the break, I went up to him and I went, they don't exist, mate. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> he goes, yeah, I know, but it's a verbal deterrent. A verbal deterrent, you know, anyway. Um, uh, this is, um, we were quickly taught on, on this day how to search someone. Uh, the other trainer came up and they went, let's say you search someone here. Down the floor, do the arms, rack the neck, have a look at the hair, all that kind of thing. Turn them around, do the thing down the back. And that was it. And it was like, right, split into groups, and you go off and search each other. And everyone just went, um, and then they went, yeah, I'm going to go and pound my laptop. And that was it. And then everyone just sat there, and he went, come on, you're not moving. Get up and go and search each other, blah, blah, blah. No attempt to teach anybody this. They just told you to do it. So people stood up and started searching each other badly. And they were having a laugh. They were tickling each other. Men were searching women, which is illegal in security, right? We were only supposed to search the same sex, anyway. Uh, so um, uh, it was a laugh. Everyone was having a big laugh. And the people that weren't having a big laugh were taking pictures of all of us and all the trainers and the room and everything like that, right? So you saw people with their mobile phones going, click, or like, click. And I was like, that's a terrorist, dude. Look, he's taking pictures. And he was like, yeah, mate, can you just delete them? And he was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> right? Of course not. And there's loads of people doing it. And again, we were told, if you get caught taking pictures or we find pictures on your phone, the police will rush in, they'll arrest you, they'll have you down at Stratford Nick, and that'll be your end of your Olympic dream, and you'll probably be prosecuted. Of course, there was no police on the premises, as far as I could see. There was a police station about a mile down the road, but I don't think they, 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 they were going to come down in any kind of hurry. Um, the uh, accreditation passes, we were told, uh, were given out to the wrong people. We know this because a trainer came into our room and said, um, uh, called out a few names, said, are these people still here because they've been given the wrong accreditation passes and they shouldn't have uniforms yet? Um, no, they had mysteriously vanished and gone home. Okay. Uh, um, so, uh, and, that, and that happened a lot. You know, they say, you know, can Simon James please uh, report to the office? You've been given a uniform, you shouldn't have one. Simon James wasn't in the room, right? Um, uh, there was more confusing x-ray training. And I say training, it was basically looking at a computer system, uh, the same one I'd done the test on, this time it was working, and um, uh, it gave you 30 seconds to look at the image. And I couldn't tell anything from anything. I was so confused by this point. And I looked at someone else and said, look, you look like you know what you're doing. Do you know what you're doing? And he went, I have no idea what I'm looking at here, dude. I'm just looking like I can do it, right? Um, uh, so this brings us to the, the fourth day. And the fourth day was called the assessment day. And we were warned and said, hey, this is going to be a fourth day. It's going to be an assessment day. You're going to be tested and assessed at every level, right? And by the way, we handpick our team leaders. Right? And there's more people going, oh, I'm a team leader already. <laughs> it's like, how do you, they're like, you can't be. We haven't unpicked you yet. And he had an email saying, you're a team leader. And so there were, there were, there were, 
Um, as I had my first email, people were getting emails all the time saying they're team leaders, and this guy hadn't even had SIA training yet. And the more team leaders I spoke to, it seemed none of them actually had SIA training. They hadn't even done the course to get the blue badge yet. They weren't even security people. They had no experience, right? So this is the assessment day. And um, uh, we walked into a room, a bit like this. It's a bit like school, isn't it? Really? Um, and it uh, had tables set up like this. And they had bags on. And what you, the trainer stood one side, and you had to search a bag. So I, I was there, and I, I made the point of taking the lining out, searching it, doing a good job, and all that kind of stuff, as you do. There was a guy standing next to me who was just looking at the bag, blank, just stone. And the trainer just took his thing and went, dick. It's all right, mate. I know what you mean. I went, I don't know what he means. <laughs> he hasn't searched the bag. Be the robot. That's exactly what he said to me. Be the robot. Mind your own business, right? Just get on and do your own thing. Um, I actually, when it came to searching somebody, um, me and this, uh, uh, my Gurkha friend, as I uh, called him, uh, he said, let's, let's search each other really badly and see if we pass it. <laughs> so we did. And we passed. <laughs> we, we actually, we, we, we didn't really search each other. We just kind of, you know, messed about and this, you know. And, uh, and we passed. And in actual fact, they had a no-fail policy. So everybody who came into that room was going to pass regardless of what they did or how they did it. Um, the, uh, uh, we were also told um, that, uh, well, it, we, we, we had lunch and we came back from lunch and we went into the courtyard of the school. And in the courtyard they built this kind of big, what they called the bomb-proof tents where all the PSAs are going to be. And, um, uh, and it had the like, accurate mock-ups of, of these pedestrian screening areas where people are going to walk through. Half of us were split up into you know, punters, and the other half were going to be the security people. Right? And I was going to be a punter to begin with. And, um, uh, and so you know, we were walking through, and you know, people putting their bags on the trays, saying, thank you very much, welcome to the Olympics, and all that kind of stuff. And the trainer came up to me and said, yeah, Ben, come here. I went, yeah, what? Well, I said, yeah, I've got a gun. Right? And it was a real gun. Right? Uh, I know it was a real gun. Because eight was heavy, and I've seen lots of real guns. But um, uh, real guns, uh, now, guns have to be orange to be training guns. You, you, they're like red plastic things, or whatever, so people can train on them. You're not allowed to have firearms, real ones, except if you're the armed police, right? So this was a real gun. So um, this just tells, gives you the feeling of these are all military guys, because this is a military company. It says on the outside that it's civilian, but really, they're all military guys. And they act like that as well. They all, you know, pretty much salute each other almost. Uh, but they're speaking that very militaristic way. Um, so I was given a gun and asked to put it in my bag and put it through the x-ray machine. And I did. And uh, it, uh, it passed straight through. The guy didn't even see it. And then um, uh, I went round again, did it again. The guy wasn't actually looking at the monitor. I said, mate, you're not even looking at the monitor. He goes, I have no idea what I'm looking at, dude. <laughs> I went, all right. Then the guy goes, uh, I'll give you a knife. I said, OK, fine. I had a knife. Uh, put it into to, to, to my uh, uh, belt at the back. And went through the walk-through metal detector. Walk-through metal detector didn't go off. Time, so okay, I'll do it again. Walk back through, did it again. Didn't go off. The guy says, "Oh, right, yeah, these are really cheap, nasty metal detectors, right? Here, have some keys, have a mobile phone, go through." And at that point, the metal detector went off. Right? The first thing that a metal detector should be able to do is detect metal, any amount of metal. But these, you have to have a load on you before they even work, right? And uh, the guy said, I said, how are we going to search all these people? And he goes, no, don't even worry about it, mate. There's 350 people going to come through this PSA an hour. And um, we're going to turn the metal detectors off during peak times. So don't worry about it. <laughs> I said, this is the Olympics. I said, so basically, if you're a terrorist, all you need to do is queue up. And there's a good chance you'll get in. And he went, yeah. It's cool, isn't it? It's the Olympics. It's like, Jesus, who are we with? So, um, uh, so basically, at the end of that day, I was so shocked and appalled that I came out of that and went, you know what, I'm not going to work at the Olympics. I've got to tell this story now. And I picked up the phone on the 13th of June to Andy Davis. Um, uh, actually, I sent him an email. And, uh, and I sent him an email and I said, hey, I've got the biggest story in London. It's going to be amazing. You're not going to believe it. I've been security for the Olympics. I've had the tr worst training ever. In actual fact, it's not really training. And uh, he calls me back, which is what he did, and, um, and, uh, and said, Nah, We're, um, uh, there's a news blackout on this. And usually when they say there's a blackout on something, it's, it's, it's a suggestion. It's not a D notice, which is what the government issue. 
and I think what's happened to me <laughs> lately is like D notes, Ben Fellows, um, they su suggest to you that you shouldn't follow certain lines of stories and what have you. Um, so uh, he said, there's a, a news blackout, I can't investigate it, we can't run the story, we're not interested, so therefore I'm not interested, it's not going to happen. And it was so rude and obnoxious to me. And usually this guy is quite nice. I mean, I spoke to him about three or four times. And every time I speak to him, I'm very polite. Hi, my name's Ben Fellows. And he said, we've worked together before. And then, you know, uh, or I've spoken to him before, what have you. He actually helped me uh, find an ex-colleague, um, which is strange, because when he called me back and tried to bribe me to retract my story, he, you know, he was saying that, uh, you know, we didn't know each other. What are you talking about? I've never spoken to you before. I was like, yeah, but I've got emails from you, man. <laughs> you know, which is what I gave to, uh, to, to Ian and, and stuff like that. So um, that led me then on to having to go. Uh, I, I was watching uh, Russia Today, feeling quite depressed after calling a few other people who wouldn't run the story as well. And uh, Tony Gosling appeared. And, and I went, that's the chap I'm going to contact. And I thought, yeah, I probably won't hear anything. Anyway, I did. And, uh, and that is it. And, and obviously, Tony can pick it up from here. Um, I hope I've been a bit more informative. Um, I hope I've kind of given you a flavour of what the training was like, or I say lack thereof. Um, and um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Uh, the, se the segue that Ben opened up at the end of his presentation is about the media. And this is a subject that I know very well, as does our next speaker who as an investigative journalist. Now, the difference between a lot of you here, I would assume you know the difference between the mainstream media and the alternative media. The mainstream media is linear, it's narrow, it's unilateral. The alternative media is multifaceted, multilateral, it's circular. It's the difference between two dimensions and three dimensions. And the analysis that you can get is up to you. You go and find the information that you want rather than have it fed down you in a tube, force fed down most of the time. So I, I do some work for a network called Russia Today. Their strap line is question more. CNN's strap line is what questions? And BBC's is don't ask questions. So that's the differences really when you're watching the news. It's the differences are unbelievable. Um, so I, don't, I do watch the, all the mainstream network uh, news programs in order to know what the various lines of discussion, talking points are. But as far as real analysis goes, I haven't found one better than Russia Today out there on the news side on a major satellite network. But uh, this particular journalist, uh, I would call him ahead of the curve. So uh, he's broken a lot of stories over the years. Uh, he's, his work. Uh, is something that I follow, and also I do keep an eye on what Tony Gosling is doing in order to get an insight before that curve comes onto the present timeline. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to put your hands together for Mr. Tony Gosling. Well, thanks, Patrick, uh, for following my stuff uh, and for the compliments, and also thanks, Ian, very much for getting this together. Uh, I mean, for something that's so important as the Olympics supposedly going on, interesting to see how few people wanted to really, I suppose, discuss some of the nitty-gritty of this G4S story, which has been a global story, massive story, and, uh, and, and I don't know how if people keep track of these things, as I did, ever since we heard the uh, news a week and a half ago or so, that 3,500 troops were going to be drafted in to uh, really take over from G4S in the, the leadership roles in the security, that we had six days of this being the main story in the country, at the top of the bulletins, which is quite extraordinary. Certainly when you consider that Andy Davis's little email that he decided he wasn't really interested in actually turned out to be something massive. So uh, I, th I think, uh, I'll tell you a bit about myself. I mean, I've started in the aviation business uh, down at Biggin Hill, uh, you remember that little place down South London, I was brought up in South London, uh, and then worked for Greater London Radio, the BBC, in the early 1990s, um, doing programmes. So I wasn't working to the news desk, uh, I was working on news programmes. That is, there was a programme called the Johnny Walker Show, which was on at lunch times, uh, and uh, Tommy Vance in the evenings, so the Drive Times programme. So I was, what I was doing was really setting up um, 
interviews for those programmes, working very closely with the news desk. And it was really the first bite of the cherry. This is the thing I love about, uh, about radio, is, you know, you're... The newspaper people and the TV people will all be queuing up at a story wherever they are, if it's a specific location. And, and I used to leave it till last because you know that the radio stuff is going to go out to people before anybody else. The, the other thing is, for example, some big story that was happening, like, for example, the stock exchange bombing in London by the IRA in the early 90s. We had, uh, you know, we covered, we heard about that. Um, we used to give a, what we used to call the voice of God in the ceiling, which was actually Broadcasting House, which would radiate out to the relevant uh, local radio stations and some voice would come on the ceiling there has been a bomb at the stock exchange suddenly people would start moving and uh, reporters would be assigned to cover it but what you think you could do with radio uh, which was what i did that morning is i knew i had a friend that worked right next to the stock exchange so i got straight on the phone to them he said oh you need to talk to the royal bank of scotland they're three or four floors up from us and he gave me the number within a few minutes we had somebody live speaking on the radio explaining to the public listening, the scene as the police were arriving at the bomb scene. So, you know, what we're able to do with radio is really, I suppose, be ahead of all the other media and get the first chance to interpret events, which is what made me, I suppose, it's once you've, done, once you've worked on that kind of thing, you can't really give it up, ever. It's not something that you think, no, I, I can't be bothered with that anymore. It's, it was a, 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 the chasing of the story uh, is a bit addictive. Uh, so, uh, uh, certainly when I, so I finished with at the BBC, I didn't give up on any, any kind of interest in journalism. I kept uh, a lot of notes at the time. I found that the internet was around uh, just when I finished there. So, a lot of those notes then went online as a sort of... Uh, and, I, and I would advise everybody to do this. If you've got notes about anything that might be of interest to somebody you've never met and are never likely to meet, put them online. It's like a, a, a sort of filing cabinet of information where you never know where it's going to become useful to somebody. And, and you know, that's, that's really what I did with a lot of stuff when, uh, when uh, I finished at the B. But then I started looking into the Bilderbergs, which are a very interesting little organisation. Uh, they were uh, basically started by a, a guy chaired by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. And um, he was in, in the SS during the war. He was a Nazi. He was also a consummate liar. Uh, and he chaired the Bilderberg conferences for phew, 20 years. Can I just see how many people have heard of the Bilderbergs? Oh yeah, pretty much. That's great. I can guarantee you, when I started doing this stuff 15 years ago, very, very few people knew, even knew they existed. Now at least we have a, an idea that there is a sort of criminal financial um, oligarchy in the West that's basically like a sort of international mafia that are steering events and and i think you know once you realize that a lot of what we're seeing at the top of our society including in our media is to do with a particular idea of ownership that is to say once you're so rich you can buy up as many yachts as you want as many prostitutes whatever you start wanting to buy politicians political parties media ownership is what it's all about and actually ownership is not what life is all about uh, it's, it's all about sharing, and it's completely, their philosophy is the total opposite of that. Anyway, getting back to um, our story about the Olympics, I think it's probably useful just to explain some of the back story to it all, which is how it, how it actually happened. I'm just trying to get some water, more water. It's hot. The, the timing was quite fascinating. It was lovely getting that email from Ben um, and immediately picking up on it. But um, we had a kind of weird... I mean, if I could go back a few years to the, the first Gulf... Uh, the uh, Sorry, invasion of Iraq. Just before that, if you remember, there was a whistleblower at, at GCHQ, Catherine Gunn. She got some information at GCHQ that said that the... Americans wanted to control the outcome of the Security Council votes and that she'd got a, 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 an email in her office at GCHQ, Government Communication Headquarters in Cheltenham, explaining that the, they were going to try and fix the vote at the Security Council. She took that information out of GCHQ, a very naughty lady, and she took it to the Guardian. But she spent weeks fretting, biting her nails, not sure if the Guardian were going to use the information. That's where I think this is all really crucial, because if you risk your life, possibly, 
to go to the press with something, and then they decide, look, this is too hot, we're going to just put it in the shredder. Where is democracy in this country? And that's the situation we're in, and we've got to have an alternative press, because the mainstream press is not doing its job, and I'll explain why not. Um, with, when this uh, YouTube interview with Ben, the 40-minute interview, many of you would have heard, we first did 22nd of June uh, on this story. When it started going viral online, there was a bit of interest from the mainstream press. Journalists got in touch with me, I put them in touch with Ben, and we were thinking, well, maybe this is just going to come out from the mainstream via, but it didn't. Ben was being interviewed, Ben was interviewed by the various people, he'd probably tell you himself, but I know for a fact, at least the BBC and the Daily Mirror, their crime correspondent, interviewed him a reasonable amount of length, had a long chat with him on the phone all about what was going on, and then nothing happened. Nothing, nothing. Of course, the implication of this being that there's, a, there's two sides to this story. There's the money side, which is all this public money, 300 million pounds, which has been thrown at G4S. And then there's, there's the other side, which is that this is actually a really good story. So which way are you going to go? Because the money side of things is horrible. If you're actually going to run the story, it means maybe G4S are going to lose their contract. You may get sued by G4S if you've got it wrong. And also it means that people aren't going to go to the Olympics. Because if this story gets out there, many, particularly young people, who are switched on and canny, are going to go, well, I'm not going to the Olympics if there's no proper security at all, and any terrorist can get in. So there you've got a, 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 a real logjam. Now, I think what, what actually happened was quite a positive thing, ultimately, is that we now do have security at the Olympics. I mean, I don't know, what, what do people think about that? Is that good? I mean, there is, there's, a, there's a dispute out there in, in the cyber world and in people's minds. They think this is a whole thing is a setup and that the, the whole thing is to bring the military in. I don't think that's true. I think that actually Ben is a genuine guy and I think that this the whole point was to make 300 million pounds for G4S without them having to hardly lift a finger and do anything. And that there was a, quite a large possibility that was going to happen. And then, also, there's a more of a possibility of someone creating some kind of false flag event easily getting some, something in there and doing some, some dangerous things at the Olympics. That was a real possibility. I think that's less of a possibility now. Uh, my own prediction for what it's worth is that we're going to have no trouble at the Olympics. I mean, uh, uh, for, for what it's worth, I say, because we never know what's going to happen. I just think the odds are now a little bit more stacked in the favour of the people attending the Olympics and the athletes. Um, so ultimately, that's, you know, that's what we're... Um, which is what we're here to talk about, isn't it? Uh, to see, is this, is this, and we'll have some time for the discussion afterwards. Now, I think it's also worth mentioning that we're also in a financial crisis, aren't we? But this isn't really a financial crisis at all. It's a crisis of tax havens with, we heard at the weekend, 21 trillion pounds which should be being taxed to pay for NHS and our schools, etc., is actually offshore in tax havens. Every year, every year we could make £70 billion pounds extra will come into the country if we actually tax those, uh, that, that offshore money. And we, we stop that. So what is going on in this country that we have such absolute, an absolute mess in, in our... Uh, economics and politics. And I think it comes back to this exact same thing of ownership, of the ownership of these political parties, certainly the top levels. I mean, I meet a lot of local politicians who are very nice people, but the parties are owned and the media is controlled. Whereas we were hearing with the BBC and, and uh, the Mirror, the journalists will come and have a chat to Ben, but once it gets up to the level of the editor, the editor's saying, no, we can't do this because they are absolutely wedded to this establishment system and they don't like stories which will really rock the boat. What I used to hear from time to time at the BBC was, it's the wrong story, it's the wrong story. And that is what often happens in newsrooms. If you have a situation where someone is saying that, well actually it's just the wrong story. It's not that it's a bad story, it's just that this is a story that people don't want to hear. Then we don't have democracy. You need to have a loop in case you hadn't noticed with democracy, you've got to have 
The public who are voting have got to have information. Sorry, I find it's a bit difficult. I've got to have information about what they're voting for. And if they don't have any about what they're voting for, you don't have a democracy. Well, actually, we have an elected dictatorship in this country anyway, because the cabinet makes the decisions is an elected dictatorship. So I don't quite know if we're qualified to be spreading democracy around the world. Um, the problem with this finance... The, the problem with this financial system is that it is just that. I mean, we hear constantly uh, sort of bad things generally about religion, but well, there is a, a religion in this country, and that religion is... Thank you. <laughs> and that religion is money. <laughs> money is a religion of its own. It means, essentially, what they're saying is uh, money talks. And let's, if we just go into uh, a horrendous bit of history, which I've been looking at recently, which is the Nazis in South America. One of the things they did at the end of the Second World War is Hitler's people knew that they were going to lose after D-Day. So they got all of the wealth they'd looted from Europe and they moved most of it over to South America. Now, over there in 1963 was a Mossad, uh, the Israeli Secret Service hit squad, ready to kidnap Nazis. And what they did, is they kidnapped Adolf Eichmann and they brought him back to Jerusalem and they put him on trial. At which point, there was a real hoo-ha. He was then hanged in Jerusalem. But a lot of the money that was coming into Israel at the time was coming through what's called the Bormann network. Now, Martin Bormann was Hitler's deputy. And Bormann was over there running a network and he'd set up 750 companies and he'd invested all the money that they'd looted from Europe which had been laundered a lot of it through the United States, in those 750 companies. And the directors of those companies were supporters of the SS from around Europe and the SS themselves. So he set up a massive financial network and a, a kind of corporate network to take on the mantle of, of Hitler, really. I mean, he was, Bormann was his number two. And so I think we've got to question the financial power today and ask, is at least some of this financial power actually built on the rewards of looting Europe in the Second World War? If you don't believe me about this, please, there's a really good book on it, which is available for nothing. It was a, uh, put together by Paul Manning, who's a CBS news correspondent in World War II. He spent two years of his life looking into this. So Manning dredged up all this information and he wrote a book called Martin Bormann, Nazi in Exile, where he absolutely explains that a lot of our companies, and he wrote this in the early 80s, are actually financed by looted money from World War II from Europe. And I think that we've just got to be really careful that we don't buy into this whole idea of money <laughs> anymore. And I'm afraid we've got leadership in this country that do right now. I mean, as I was saying, an elected dictatorship. We've got Lord Green. Right? If people have heard this over the last week or so, Lord Green was the chairman of HSBC when they were laundering trillions of pounds for the Mexican drug cartels in 2008. Now those drug cartels were the people who are basically the biggest, some of the biggest international organised criminals in the world, were leaving hundreds of bodies by the side of the road, people they killed who got in their way. Lord Green, who was a government minister, was in charge of HSBC when the decisions were made to launder their money. So, you know, this is not democracy, right? This is being, we're being run by organised crime, financial criminals. So, I think we've just got to face these facts. I haven't seen that on the BBC, by the way. I haven't also seen on the BBC the fact that Lord Reith, who started the BBC, uh, wouldn't let Winston Churchill on the airwaves. Uh, until 1938. And he, we didn't hear voices which were against Hitler on the radio in the 1930s until Reith was sacked because he was, he's on the record as congratulating Hitler for invading Czechoslovakia. So as you can see, you know, the BBC has got a bit of a track record of being uh, to the far right and supporting fascism. Uh, actually what happened was that they had to sack Reith in order to get this Churchill and the anti-Nazi voices on the radio in this country. Now, when was the last time you heard that on the BBC? 
on a BBC history programme? No, because they don't really like to tell you that actually broadcasting is one of the most important aspects of our national life and our national culture. Uh, another part, I mean, I can remember this is, if you go back to 1975, Harold Wilson, uh, he was bugged and burgled by MI5 out of office and forced to resign. Um, and at the time, they said at the time, if you can control the Queen, Heathrow Airport, and the BBC, you've taken over the country. <laughs> right? So the BBC is certainly one of the key elements in controlling the nation, uh, because they decide really what we, what we see and hear. And what is the national debate? And I'm glad to see that this G4S story finally made it there. Okay, so as to what to do about some of this, um, I think it's also really important for people to understand how the BBC has changed. I mean, I was there uh, in the early 90s. I could see it going downhill. They were introducing something called producer choice, which was about putting financial boundaries throughout the corporation in a wonderful way. When I first started, it was like one big happy family. People would just talk to each other, share information, no problem. We had nice um, uh, directories with every different part of the BBC. You could phone up and ask a local radio station, anybody. It was all like one unit. And then John Burt was brought in, and Burtism. And they started compartmentalising everything off into little bits, and you had to then get the permission of your producer if you wanted to speak to somebody else. So the whole thing was fragmented. Um, and I think that that's a large part of why we're in a situation today where something can happen, like the September the 11th attacks, or the 7-7 attacks, without any proper investigative document, documentary being done on, it, on the subject. I mean, there hasn't been a proper public inquiry into the 7-7 London bombings. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think we're going to see uh, a proper judicial investigation and people you know, interrogated as to what actually happened. Everything's swept under the carpet. Has anyone noticed with Leveson, the way it's all sort of done for to be, to be watched on TV? It's not really any kind of judicial process. People can just come up with any answers they want to come up with. Oh dear, I'm, I'm really sorry, I don't remember. It seems to be the, the standard reply. And, um, and there was a wonderful graphic on the BBC, actually, and funnily enough, the other day, um, showing who's, who said, uh, I cannot remember, I cannot recall, the no largest number of times in their evidence. Does anyone, would anyone like to venture a guess as to who is the highest? David Cameron. David Cameron. Who else? Bob no, 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 Bob Diamond wasn't, I don't think, at the Leveson Inquiry. No, he wasn't there either. But anyway, okay, let's, I'll just tell you the answer. Cameron was second. He said, I can't remember, I can't recall. And I've worked this out as a proportion. Some gave long speeches, right? But Cameron was, was number two. I can't recall. He said it 49 times in his evidence. And this, the, most, the, the most intense uh, use of that expression was a guy called Andy Coulson. He only said it 28 times, but that was actually, uh, he got the gold medal for saying it the most frequently. <laughs> so, look, what these people are is criminals. They have, I mean, uh, they have actually been charged now at last, isn't that right? Because yesterday, after something like seven years of the police having absolute prima facie evidence of phone hacking, it's taken them that long to do it. A large part of that is because our press is not answer, is not telling us these are criminal offences. What they're saying is, oh, well, maybe we need to change the law about press. No, you don't need to change the law at all. The law is already there. It's just the police aren't prosecuting. Now, this gets us, I think, to the nub of the matter with what's wrong with this country and London is the Metropolitan Police because what's going on in the police is that there are now more investigations. It's like, imagine now, the Scotland Yard, it must be like Iraq, a battleground, or Syria. You've got different factions, you've got criminals within there. Did you know that people, are, detectives, are coming into work at Scotland Yard on a Monday morning to find that evidence that they've taken months to put together has been deleted from the system and gone forever? 
That's how bad things have become. It's become the best organised criminal gang in the country operating in Scotland Yard. Now, I think you, what you can do is look at that in parallel with what's going on in the city as well. Because the city are also doing criminal activities. We had Ian Fraser a couple of weeks ago on the Max Kaiser show on Russia Today explaining how in 1992 there was a trial, uh, the Blue Arrow trial, and there was a decision made after this trial of bankers that there were going to be no more prosecutions. And it was just like, okay, you can do what you want now. And so we've had something like 20 years of criminality, constant criminality. So all we're asking for, really, is what Barbara Tucker on Parliament Square and Brian Hall before her were asking for, which is for the rule of law. Let's have a law that applies to everybody. I mean, isn't this an old story that goes back through thousands of years of history that we, all we want is the law of law to apply to them as well as us? We've had looters who've stolen a bottle of water, put in jail for months, and yet these people who've stolen, I mean, the LIBOR fixing scandal, that they've stolen billions and billions of pounds, and yet they're still walking the streets. We've got Tony Blair still walking the streets after his criminal activity. I mean, he, should, of course, should be in, in jail for war crime. So, so there is, a, you know, a, that's, that, that's really what I'd, I'd like to um, say in regards to the, the political side of things, is that the media has a duty, it really does, to call these people to account, and it's not doing that in this country anymore. Uh, we have to just kick it to do so. But the, the thing is, with the journalists, it's easy to blame them, but it's not them that's really the, responsible for this. It's the owners of the transmitters, right? The journalists, we journalists do not own transmitters. Even at my community radio, I don't own the transmitter. It's owned by, you know, by higher-ups. And it's also the editors and the managers. And in the BBC, you'll find this massive bureaucracy of editors and managers, and at Channel 4 and all these other places. That's where the problem lies, because they're picking people who are providing us with reassurance, pats on the back, that everything's fine, when it certainly is not fine, right? We've had another aircraft carrier just sent to the Gulf. Um, and we have a potential nuclear conflict about to kick off in the Middle East any time with Syria and Iran, um, because there's every chance that the Iranians do have nuclear weapons. I mean, Ben Fellow, where, where is he now? Ben, he's outside. He worked on the Cook Report, right? The Cook Report managed to get a, a sample of weapons-grade plutonium uh, as one of their programs, and from an arms dealer who was bragging, oh yeah, you can buy, a, buy some weapons-grade plutonium and make yourself a nuclear bomb. No, surely not. But anyway, they took a sample of it, got it tested on the program, and found, God, it really was weapons grade plutonium. They got it from Ukraine, from Russia. Uh, so don't tell me that the Iranians need to start from scratch, from a centrifuge and a nuclear pile, and make a bit of plutonium to make a bomb. They can get the stuff on the open black market. So there's a lot of trickery going on. My, my thinking is that it's possibly uh, uh, to do with um, this, the Iraq business with weapons of mass destruction. Maybe they'll just try that one again. The trouble is, if you look back at what happened with Iraq and WMD, the whole of the press was selling us that lie. What happened at the BBC because of that? Well, Andrew Gilligan was sacked. The Director General Greg Dyke was sacked for telling us the truth. What they did is they told us that the weapons of mass destruction thing was all sexed up, and as it turned out, it was. But we weren't allowed to know that at the time. So all I'm saying is, I think, ultimately, we really do need that alternative media. Better still, though, we need good people in charge of our mainstream media who have audiences of millions. And the Cook Report, by the way, had an audience of 10 million when it was pulled in 1997. A massive audience. So there's a real demand amongst the public for this kind of stuff. It's just that it's being stifled. Thankfully, we can watch it on Russia Today a little bit, but, I mean, they've, they've stopped us watching press TV. Press TV's lost its license from Ofcom, so we're not allowed to see that in Britain. <laughs> that's, 
the program from uh, Iran. And so this is really being used, I think, as a precursor, uh, as a precursor to war. Now, what does this tell us about uh, what's been going on in the mainstream press? Uh, it, it brought, I come back again to Thatcherism and John Burt and what happened uh, in 1990, sorry, 87, there was big changes at the BBC. If you remember, there was a kind of, if, for the older among us, we can remember when we used to get things like World in Action and uh, This Week, Death on the Rock, where a few weeks after the, the SAS had killed some uh, IRA terrorists, shot them, shoot to kill policy in Gibraltar. We had a documentary on the television explaining it to us this week, Jonathan Dimbleby. Nowadays, we don't get any of that at all. It's just one after another lie. We are told the other, the other week, by the way, that the Syrian defense minister, a Christian, uh, who was killed by apparently a suicide bomber in, uh, in, the, in Damascus, in his uh, security headquarters, along with another general. That was the week before, that was last week actually, wasn't it? Last week, how time flies. Uh, that actually, well, eyewitnesses have said that it was a drone strike. A missile came down from the ground. So we're here on the news in the morning, it was a suicide bomber. And by the end of the day, it could be anything. Who cares, who knows? It was just a bomb. This meme of the suicide bomber is being used all the time to make out that the person that's doing it is a lunatic, they're dangerous. It could be anything. It could be a satellite weapon, you know, a drone. It could be a, like President Dudayev was, was assassinated, a head of Chechnya, by the Russians using a missile uh, that, that locked into his mobile phone. You check that one out online. He was talking, uh, someone phoned him to talk about peace. And he was on his mobile phone and a missile from a plane homes in on his phone and blown him to pieces. And he's the president of Chechnya. So this technology is out there, it's just that it's not on world in action anymore because there was no such thing. We've got panorama, but it's all very tame. It's all safe. Uh, and you know, if, if nothing else comes out of this G4S story, I'd like to feel that we can give the British media a bit of a kick and say, well, look, come on, you know, let's have some really investigative journalism. The th trouble is, of course, it costs money. And the people with the money don't want the investigative journalism. What they're doing is they're actually holding back <laughs> civilization, the advance of our civilization and saying, no, no, we don't want that. We want everyone to be basically stupid and ignorant and just, in a way, like robots, you know, just, just here's, here's, here's uh, you know, everything that you need to know is going to be served up to you, but actually you're getting nothing. And I think increasingly people are switching off to BBC. Certainly young people I know don't watch television generally. They, they don't really find anything of interest in it. A lot of them are watching stuff on the internet. They'll watch stuff online, they'll share stuff, share files. And there's a, I think, one of the most positive things is the, the attack on the students by the Liberal Democrats when they went into coalition with the Tories. This really politicised loads of our younger generation to think to themselves, wow, how could these people get us to vote for them and then just sell us out completely? What they've done is they've politicised the whole young generation. And those are very intelligent, educated, and canny young people. And I think, you know, the young, this whole image of the youngsters being sort of dangerous, stupid, or whatever, is completely wrong, the hoodies, you know. Actually, they are almost like revolutionaries. They've been made revolutionaries by Nick Clegg and his stupidity in promising them everything and then selling them out after the last, uh, after the last election. So coming, coming back anyway to the sort of number of this, where the BBC has always been the benchmark. Other organisations, we pay for it from our licence fee. We have to pay for it. And it's always been the benchmark. In 1987, they were producing things like the Secret Society series with Duncan Campbell, which was absolutely pulling apart the secrecy of government and the Ministry of Defence all sorts of fascinating stuff, including a really good programme all about how America would take over Britain if there were a third world war. Americans would move in and tell us all what to do. Fascinating stuff. And this wasn't light. So 
at least by the Thatcher government. So what happened was Victor Rothschild, who's a, I think he's a Labour peer, but I mean he's one of those sort of Labour people you can think, well they're not really, really very Labour, a bit of a Blair maybe. Victor Rothschild spoke to Marmaduke Hussey and said, can you sack the Director General? And Hussey says this in his autobiography. And so he did. Alistair Milne was the guy who was sacked. He was a fantastic journalist, really good Director General. The BBC up till that point had been doing its job. Since then, it's been downhill ever since. And his, his son, by the way, is Seamus Milne, who's a Guardian columnist. And I thoroughly recommend Seamus, I mean, I'm on Seamus' Twitter feed, for example. Seamus is absolutely on the ball and a really good Guardian columnist. But um, now the latest we've got is Chris Patton. He's the chairman of the board of governors of the BBC and he's just sitting next to another Bilderberger on the board. Now, Marcus Agius is the uh, chairman of Barclays, right? He resigned a couple of weeks ago, then he came back again. Do you remember that? The next day. Yeah, the next day he's back, you know, make an announcement, he's resigned. Next day he's in the same job as chairman again. This is how cheeky these people are. And also it tells me, maybe there aren't enough super crooks. Maybe they haven't got quite enough of these super crooks to run things in their corrupt fashion. But Marcus Agius was on, this, on the BBC Trust alongside Chris Patton, was one of the people that chose the new Director General. These people are evil. They are crooked and they are in charge of our media. So we really do need to uh, fight back in some fashion